We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. So, again, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this video, uh, which uh, contains uh, um, the word trust and be trusted, is not produced by, by the Dynamic Coalition, but is a standard video with which um, any session of the IGF starts. Um, but it's, it's a nice coincidence indeed, because uh, the, the words uh, trust and uh, be trusted are prominent in the video. And this is also uh, everything uh, you know, about this, uh, this session of the Dynamic Coalition on Data and Trust. So thanks uh, everybody uh, for joining uh, the Dynamic Coalition on Data and Trust session at the IGF 2021. We did really hope that we could have had it in person in Poland uh, um, for you know, various factors we all know. We prefer to have it virtually um, and uh, hopefully next year we'll be in person so we will be able to meet and greet face to face uh, uh, again. Um, the Dynamic Coalition on Data and Trust uh, was launched in 2020, just in the middle of the pandemic, when we did see there was a sort of gap about, uh, you know, the, in the IGF Dynamic Coalition landscape, um, a gap for, you know, speaking and talking and discussing and sharing best practices on data and trust. And that's why we launched the Dynamic Coalition together with Emily and Oxil in uh, 2020. And we did want from the very start this coalition to be truly dynamic. And that's why we do have regular sessions and calls throughout the year, as we did this year, um, with several calls and one session during the Eurodig meeting in Trieste. At that time, we managed to, to be live uh, from Trieste with some speakers uh, remotely connected, but other speakers with us live from Trieste. That said, uh, um, today's session is all about uh, data management and data accuracy and uh, the NIST 2 directive, which uh, you know, is a really a hot topic uh, in the DNS industry. We will uh, manage uh, um, in the next uh, 55 uh, minutes, 60 minutes to speak about uh, uh, data management and data accuracy and the NIST 2 directive from different perspectives, um, starting um, with uh, an overview of the NIST 2 directive uh, by the European uh, Commission. We have uh, Benjamin Bogel with us, uh, and then we'll move uh, to Paulina um, Malaya of uh, uh, Center, Policy Director at Center. She has been uh, regularly updating the Center. Center is the Council of European National Top Level Domain Registries, uh, this umbrella organization for CCTLD, but not only CCTLD operators. Uh, and uh, um, she has been regularly updating the center membership about uh, the evolution of the NIST 2 directive at uh, the legislative uh, process uh, level. We will uh, uh, then uh, uh, move on with uh, um, the other speaker, who is uh, uh, Dirk Jumper, security manager at URID. Dirk, uh, uh, URID is the registry operator for .u and uh, its equivalent in uh, Cyrillic and in Greek. And uh, .u, as uh, uh, URID, uh, as in many other registries, we have been following the uh, impact of the NIST 2 directive on our operations uh, and the actions that have to be uh, deployed by the registry to make sure that at some point we are fully compliant uh, um, with uh, the forthcoming NIST 2 directive. Um, we'll move on with Kit Drasek of uh, VeriSign. And thank you so much, Kit, for joining at the very last minute. And I believe you will provide a, um, a very interesting, uh, you know, um, view of what you think is, uh, you know, the 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 NIST two directive and all, um, um, you know, what Verisign does in terms of data accuracy and data management. Verisign is the largest registry operator worldwide level, and uh, Verisign is the operator of .com .net and uh, uh, other. Um, TLDs. So uh, thank you again, Kit, for joining. And we will uh, end with uh, Arda Gerkens 
um, who is from the Online Child Abuse Assessment Bureau. And she will provide an interesting perspective from um, a special area of, you know, special group of the end users. So we will uh, collect all the opinions and all the views on um, data accuracy, data management, and the needs to directive. But at the same time, we want really this to be an interactive session. We have Emily Taylor with me to, uh, as the online moderator. Um, I'd like to leave the floor to Benjamin first of the European Commission. Um, I'd like also to invite the speakers to, to stick to the five, six minutes as we have agreed. Uh, and um, we will collect questions from remote uh, participants and ask the questions directly and then open at the end the floor uh, for a discussion. So thank you, Benjamin, you're the first. Great, thank you very much, Giovanni. So my name is Benjamin Bögel. I work in the European Commission in the Cybersecurity Policy Unit, and I'm part of the team that has been working on the NIS Directive uh, since the proposal came out. And I will quickly provide, a, like I will quickly walk you through the main elements of the directive. And this will not be very specific to DNS. It will be a general overview so that you know the framework, you understand it, also with a little bit of background for those that are maybe not from the European Union and that don't know how EU law works. And then we can get into the details in the Q&A. Okay, so the NIS directive um, is a directive that has come into force in 2016 already, covering uh, seven sectors of the economy and some digital service providers. And uh, we have now in um, December 2020 um, decided to propose to revise it, to make it fit for the digital age, so to speak, and also taking into account the experiences that we've had with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, what I will present to you now is a proposal by the Commission. So this is not a final law. It's a proposal that uh, still has to go through the legislative process. The legislative process has already started. We already have a position by the European Parliament on the one hand, and there is also a position already by the Council, which gathers the member states of the European Union. And we will uh, soon enter, probably beginning of January, we will enter um, trilogue discussions. That means that the three institutions that I just mentioned, Commission, Parliament and Council, will together um, negotiate to come up with the final legal text. Um, the NIST directive is a directive. That means that its rules are not directly applicable in the member states, but they need to be transposed by the European member states into national law, and only then the rules apply, actually. Um, so that's a quick introduction into where we stand at the moment. So our proposal basically maintains the three pillars that already exist in the current uh, directive. And the first pillar is uh, that we want to improve the member state capabilities. So our directive um, requires member states to put in place cybersecurity authorities that um, implement the rules of the directive, but also so-called CSERT. These are computer security incident response teams. And in addition, the member states are required to put in place national cybersecurity strategies and frameworks on um, coordinated vulnerability disclosure and crisis management. So that was the first pillar on the member state capabilities. The second pillar, which is probably the most interesting one for you, is on the risk management and reporting of entities. So these are usually companies, but they could also be public entities. There will be two types of entities. Um, defined by the new directive, essential and important entities. And uh, these companies, they are required to take cybersecurity measures. They are very high level in our directive, these measures, and then further specified by, by the member states. And these entities will also have to notify significant incidents and cyber threats. And uh, the third pillar of the directive is on cooperation and information exchange. So there are two fora established by the directive, the cooperation group, which gathers the national cybersecurity authorities. Um, and this cooperation group discusses strategic issues um, and policy issues. And then there is the CSERTS network. So the network of computer security 
incident response teams where those uh, incident response teams can jointly discuss, discuss major incidents and how to respond to them, especially incidents that have a cross-border dimension. And uh, yeah, uh, under this pillar, we also have uh, European frameworks for coordinated vulnerability disclosure and crisis management. And it also foresees a biannual ENISA report. ENISA is the European Cybersecurity Agency. And this report will contain a ranking comparing the capabilities of the member states in terms of cybersecurity and policy. So um, of interest for you is maybe the scope. So um, the scope is basically a list of sectors in which the entities that are part of these sectors will have to take the measures that I mentioned. So cybersecurity measures and incident reporting. And uh, so far there have been seven sectors, energy, transport, banking, financial market infrastructures, health, drinking water and digital infrastructure. And the list will now grow much longer. It will also include public administration space, postal and courier services, waste management, chemicals, food, manufacturing. And um, in the digital sector, so, so far we have covered uh, so-called digital providers. These were search engines, online marketplaces, and cloud providers, but also DNS, uh, providers, top level domain uh, registries and internet exchange points. And in the future, under the new directive, if agreed by the co-legislators, the parliament and the council, we will also include uh, social networks, data centers, content delivery networks, and electronic communications and trust service providers. So internet service providers and trust service providers. Although the latter, they're actually not a new category. They are merely transfer, transferred over from another existing uh, legal instrument. And uh, yeah, so that's the scope that we are looking at. Um, entities, there will be a size threshold, so not all entities will have to take the measures, but only the ones that are medium in size or larger, with the exception of uh, top level domain registries, and uh, we also propose this exception for DNS service providers, so in these cases they will have to be covered irrespective of size. Um, the risk management measures that I mentioned, they're very high level. So it's about incident handling, business continuity, supply chain security, et cetera. And the incident reporting requirement would be to um, issue a first report within 24 hours after, you've, after you know that you have uh, experienced an incident in your organization. Um, I will also briefly speak about the specific article in the directive, Article 23 on who is. Um, that's actually not my unit that has been uh, dealing with that, but another unit in my organization. And that's why I also brought a colleague of mine, Melina Strungi, who will happily answer any questions on this specific aspect of the directive. So um, Article 23, um, requires member states to ensure that top level domain registries and entities providing registration services make uh, maintain accurate and complete registration data and provide lawful access to such data. In more detail, this article um, ensures that domain registration data um, that is not personal data is published without undue delay, that the access to specific domain, domain name registration data upon lawful and duly justified requests of legitimate access seekers is possible, and that these requests are uh, replied to without undue delay. So um, that's, that's a brief overview of the directive. I think I've exceeded my time, so sorry for that. Yes, and you did, and, and, but you are brave enough to put your face uh, be, you know, in front, uh, because it's a very controversial directive to date, especially for the DNS industry. So, Thank you, thank you for again putting and showing your face. And and I don't know if Medina would like to to add anything to what uh, Benjamin just said. Yes, uh, hello everyone. Um, I think Benjamin covered most of it. Just to briefly mention specifically for Article Twenty Three, that it aims um, at creating a legal framework that would support the prevention and fight of DNS abuse and uh, ultimately cont contribute to the increasing uh, to the increase of the overall level of cybersecurity uh, in the EU. And as Benjamin mentioned, this would be achieved by ensuring the accuracy 
of domain name registration data, ensuring the publication of registration data that concern legal entities and that are not personal data, and also ensuring that um, the registries and registrars will have a firm legal ground to provide access to specific domain name registration data upon lawful and duly justified requests from legitimate access seekers. Last but not least, another, um, another element is that Article 23 aims at ensuring that all requests to access to domain name registration data receive a timely reply. Either positive or negative, it doesn't matter as long as uh, any request is properly addressed. And also the Commission um, reserves the right to issue any guidelines on the topics of accuracy uh, on domain uh, name registration data, uh, including on its disclosure uh, by drawing from industry good practices in order to support a harmonized approach uh, across the industry in the EU. So I hope that was not too long. <laughs> uh, I'll, leave, uh, I'll leave that to you. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Melina. Um, I see that, uh, you know, Emily, is there any question from the floor? And thank you, Emily, for moderating the, the online floor. Uh, thank you very much, Giovanni. Um, yes, Laurie has, has asked a question about whether registries, reg, registrars are included or just registries. Um, and Benjamin has, has put a, a reply in the chat on that, but um, maybe we can come back to that and then invite Laurie to take the floor at, at some stage when we've gone through our speakers. Okay. Um, we also have a request uh, for the microphone from Susan Payne. And in fact, maybe we can use the raise hand function, Giovanni, for people yeah. who would like to ask a question um, so that we can uh, run through our speakers. Thank you. Yeah. So, Susan. Um, I'm sorry, may, sorry. Can, can I quickly uh, jump in just for the question in the yes. chat? Uh, so, as rightly said by Benjamin, uh, I mean, he covers he covers the the NIS nice, uh, provisions. Uh, just for Article 23, to note that just for this provision, also registrars are covered. So basically, if you read the wording of Article 23, it refers to domain uh, uh, registries and the entities providing services to them for them. So uh, this this uh, is meant to also cover registrars. And, and I repeat for Article 23 uh, only. Thanks. Thank you, Melina, for, for clarifying. Uh, Susan. Susan, I see your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I wasn't sure if I should wait for the rest of the speakers, but it is a question um, specifically on this. Um, and, and particularly on, on the decision to include all TLD operators, irrespective of size, and, and more particularly, irrespective of um, the business model of, of that TLD operator. Um, and the thing I'm, I'm thinking of in particular um, is that a number of um, brand owner um, or you know, a number of companies have have what what are termed um, dot brand TLDs, which are essentially um, more of an internal matter. They are not providing a, a service um, to the public at large. Um, they may, um, if if they choose to operate in such a way, they might particularly um, they might allocate names to say um, trademark licensees or group companies. Um, but it's not a, a sort of public service and it's not a sort of an essential infrastructure um, to the wider public. It may well be essential infrastructure for them internally. So my question is, why, why would they, why do you perceive the need to be regulating them in the same way as, um, a, you know, an open um, sort of retail model, um, top level domain? Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Um, any short and, and, and uh, you know, reaction from Melina or Benjamin? So if your brand top level domain is only used for internal purposes and you're not providing it as a service, so if you're not providing a registration service to the wider public, it's out of scope. Our uh, directive only applies to services that are um, available publicly. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, very clear answer. And speaking about registries, uh, who's best than Polina to take the floor as uh, she's fully into registry uh, with Center. So thank you, Polina. The floor is yours. Uh, 
with uh, all the discussions that have been going on in the central community about uh, this uh, directive. And thanks a lot again for your updates to this community. Thank you, Giovanni, very much. And uh, yes, good afternoon for, or good evening uh, from my side as well. And uh, yes, uh, once again, uh, great thanks to Giovanni and also Emily for organizing this very timely debate and, uh, of course, for inviting me today uh, to give a short overview of how NIS2 is relevant for DNS actors and specifically to TLD registries. And I will try to not repeat already what has been so helpfully and extensively covered by Benjamin and Melina. But just to a quick overview is that, again, to reiterate that NIS2 um, aims to increase cybersecurity resilience of sectors deemed to be critical for functioning of the society. And uh, one of those critical sectors uh, is rightfully also a cornerstone of the internet infrastructure, and that is the domain name system. And as already uh, identified by Benjamin, NIS2 is essentially a revision of the uh, currently valid uh, legal framework in the European Union, so the NIS directive that was adopted back in 2016. And um, actually already in 2016, the essential status of DNS and specifically of DOD registries was first time confirmed by policymakers uh, in the EU. And uh, NIS directive suggested that TOD sector can be considered essential, but left the identification process of concrete operators that could fall as operators of essential services to the EU member states. Uh, and uh, of course, NIS directive also established a, a national supervisory regime over operators of essential services and established the need to follow the minimum set of information security measures by variety of operators across the European Union. And in the past five years, uh, European CCTOTs um, were already consistently identified as operators of essential services as part of the digital infrastructure sector as established by the NIS directive. And this confirmed and it also in some ways encouraged additional investments into security of networks and information systems within the European CCTOTs. So the question now is, uh, how is NIS2 different? And um, specifically when it comes to the DNS, uh, NIS2 makes a few important statements directly in its text. So um, in the proposal then I'm referring at the moment as uh, Benjamin identified. And um, it's different from the mere suggestion to include DNS sector as essential as established by the uh, current NIS directive. So specifically, NIS2 explicitly recognizes that upholding and preserving a reliable, resilient and secure DNS is a key factor in maintaining the integrity of the internet. So that's an important statement to frame the, the obligations and uh, additional um, provisions that NIS2 put forward. Furthermore, according to the NIS text, maintaining accurate and complete databases of registration data, so so-called WHOIS data as referred in the proposal, and providing lawful access to such data is essential to ensure the security, stability, and resilient resilience of the DNS. So that's uh, another important statement in the NIS2 proposal. And finally, the availability and timely accessibility of this data, as also pointed out by Melina, um, is stated to be essential to prevent and combat DNS abuse. So as a result, the NIS2 goes further than its predecessor NIS directive by first enlarging the scope uh, to more digital infrastructure services, and in particular the DNS services, since DNS uh, is uh, re recognized as a critical um, key um, component for supporting digital economy and society. The scope of the NIS2 is also extraterritorial, so it, it encompasses all services available in the European Union. And secondly, importantly for TLD sector, is that it puts a special emphasis on a so-called data accuracy obligation on TLD registries and registrars. Um, that is essential for security and stability and resilience of DNS. And that is the Article 23 that Medina has also already provided an overview of. And according to the proposal, again, I will just reinstate what Medina already said, but just to frame our discussion a bit further. Um, TLD registries and registrars uh, would be obliged to collect and maintain accurate and complete registration data, publish all registration data concerning legal entities, and provide access to non-public personal information to all legitimate access seekers. 
And uh, as already also identified uh, by Benjamin, uh, this is currently a proposal. So the uh, negotiations on the final text are, are still ongoing. And uh, the co-legislators in the European Parliament and the Council of European Union have been also working on their respective drafts of the legislation before they can enter the final negotiation rounds. And when it comes to Article 23, both co-legislators are in favor of adding additional obligation within the data accuracy uh, scope, that is to verify um, the registration data, in addition of keeping it nearly accurate and complete. And uh, the co-legislators are also in favor of specifying which data sets should be kept accurate, complete, and essentially verified. And if uh, some of these uh, positions will prevail uh, in the final stage of the negotiations, DOD registries and registrars can be obliged to verify registrants, for example, physical addresses and phone numbers, uh, in addition to their identity and other contact details. So, um, and with regards to legitimate access seekers and their access, as also already pointed out by Melina, but within the co-legislators' uh, positions, um, there might be also an obligation to respond to these legitimate access seekers' requests within 72 hours. So, in a nutshell, uh, such data accuracy obligation will have a significant impact on existing policies and procedures in place across the industry. And um, we feel that the impact of that on the cybersecurity, though, is limited. So while registration database accuracy is, of course, important for the overall health of domain name zones, it's also important to keep in mind that it is not strictly a, a network and information security issue, as it won't help uh, to address all different cybersecurity threats when it comes to maintaining uh, security, stability, and resilience of DNS. So for example, it won't help with addressing such um, uh, cybersecurity threats as DDoS attacks or DNS hijacking, for example. And so the reach of data verification obligation, if we look at the co-legislators' positions, is limited. And it really cannot be also claimed as the most important issue for DNS security, as it has been stated in the proposal in, the, yeah, in, in providing the framework for these additional obligations. And of course, after all, NIS2 is not also only about registration data accuracy, but there is a significant attention given to this very specific issue. And we feel that there is a risk of shifting the focus on the issue that might not bring significant security benefits for DNS. And of course, this at the expense of individual actors uh, such as registries and registrars. So with that, finally, I would like to just state um, that um, it is also worth to reiterate that ensuring safe and trusted online space for consumers, businesses, and public sector is a collaborative effort of many actors involved. And um, consequently, increased collaboration between infra infrastructure actors and competent authorities based on a clear procedure and the rule of law is the key to make sure that the online space remains a safe space for all. So thank you for that and uh, back to you, Joanna. Thanks a lot, Paulina. It was a, a very healthy reminder about uh, the multi-stakeholder nature of the internet community and the importance of uh, having a constructive uh, and, uh, and good dialogue among the different parties. Uh, so thank you so much. And also thank you for having brought up again the you know, part of the statement uh, that Sant made uh, in uh, the official position of center membership about uh, how much data accuracy contributes uh, to uh, uh, let's say safer and more resilient uh, internet uh, infrastructure. Um, Emily, um, is there any question from, from the floor? Any hand up that I, I may have missed? I'm not seeing anything uh, just now. Thank you, Giovanni. But uh, just to encourage all participants to, to raise their hand or to post some questions in the chat and we can pick them up uh, as you've done uh, in the flow. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Emily. So let's move uh, straight to the next uh, uh, panelist, uh, who is Dirk, Security Manager at URID he has been completely, completely, completely booked over the past uh, 24 months uh, by all the compliance requirements to make URID up to speed with the, all the obligations uh, as an essential operator. And he has done a, a great, great work uh, to also brief uh, and communicate internally 
the importance of the different things we have to comply with. So thank you, Dirk, the floor is yours. Thank you, Giovanni, and good day, everyone. Um, as a CCTLD registry operator, we are obviously very curious about what's going on in the NIST2 landscape. And it looks like everybody is obsessing about Article 23, but just to give a, a side note, there is um, 42 other articles in, in the NIST directive, which all of them, they have an impact on, on, on the registry operator. <clears throat> but there are a couple of questions that we are asking ourselves, and, and there are plenty of open questions. And, and this is also very true amongst the, C, the, the different European CCTLDs. And those open questions are about how is this directive going to be transposed into member state law? And um, as an operator of essential services, we have already seen how this happened in Belgium, for instance. And the Belgian transposition is different from the Dutch transposition or the Luxembourgian transposition, which is also the reason why there is a NIS2 directive. Uh, for instance, in Belgium, the scope of the NIS directive is different from the one in Luxembourg of the one in, in, in the Netherlands. So in Belgium, it's only about the DNS services, whereas in other countries, the registration services are also included within the NIS directive or the NIS implementation. The other open question we also have is how, where will registrars fit into this image? Because if you read the NIST directive, registrars can be part of the essential entities. If they're large enough and they are offering uh, um, uh, author authoritative uh, services, then they also become essential, service, uh, essential entities, which is not true, of course, for most of the registrars, because most of the registrars will be small enough not to fall under that category. That's not, uh, as mentioned earlier by Melina, Article 23 is a, a little bit of an exception on this because it includes all the registrars. And then of course, there's this big question, what about the GTLD space? The NIS directive, even in its original version, never made a distinction between GTLDs and CCTLDs. TLDs are TLDs, whatever they are. The thing is, member states have translated this into CCTLDs in Europe which means that, for instance, in Belgium, then you have the funny situation that both .eu and .be are both, both falling under the same regulator. And in the Netherlands, for instance, you only have SIDN dealing with .nl. But if the GTLDs are also included, there are plenty of European GTLDs, and then we have a completely different ballgame. CCTLDs are governed in a different way than GTLDs on the level of the internet governance. GTLDs are governed by ICANN, whereas CCTLDs in, CCTLDs in most cases are completely governed by them themselves. So again, that's a very important question. Now the internet has um, another open question, I think, is that the internet is open by nature and international by nature. And so we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean when the NIS directive is transposed into member state law, including some of the registrars, but what about jurisdictions? We fall under the Belgian jurisdiction, but if we have a large registrar, I'm just giving an example like a French large registrar who might also be a registry, well, what if they also fall under the French uh, uh, implementation of the NIS directive and how is this going to work on, 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 a, on a European scale? So all these questions um, still need to be answered. And especially when we're looking at Article 23, there's a lot of interpretation possible, possibilities. And there's also a lot of things that can be added by the member states. When I read the last version of the, of the NIS directive, the, the version of the 26th of November, then the amount of data that is supposed to be accurate and complete is limited to a relatively small set. Originally, it was a much larger set, but now it's a smaller set. But that implies that member states can interpret this and add things to this thing. Um, so there we have the question of how is this, again, how is this going to be interpreted by the member states? And will there be guidance either by the European Commission or by the industry to help facilitating this thing? Because this exercise is quite complicated. Um, when we're looking at Article 23 more specifically, Article 23, Paragraph 3 is quite an interesting one because that one is the one about the policies and standards that will be used, which need to be public to validate or not to validate, to, um, to make those, that data that is collected uh, accurate and complete. So again, these are open things that are not very well defined. In the meantime, the industry, of course, is looking at this directive and trying to work together. So there is several initiatives already within the uh, within the .eu, sorry, and within the European uh, TLD uh, community to try to understand how we are going to uh, react upon all these different obligations and how we can deal with this, taking into account that it's a directive and not a regulation. But lastly, and that's, this is just a little remark, the DNS is not about registration data. The DNS is about the DNS. 
it is a system that allows us to use the internet as it is. And <clears throat> we have to make sure that we don't forget this. I mean, making sure that the DNS is stable and resilient, which it has been for more than 30 years without any big issues, is utterly and the most important thing. The DNS must flow. To paraphrase Frank Herbert, it is the DNS that is important. And why is this important? If we think about the future, we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we can treat all domain names equally, but also equally important because not all domain names are actually equal. If a domain name, for instance, is used in a smart city and it's literally used for a thousand or maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices, if that domain name would have, if something would happen to that domain name, that's a big issue. So we have to be careful not to focus too, too obsessively about DNS abuse and not forget the other things that are happening with the DNS and where the DNS is an essential component. And with that, I'll leave the floor to questions or remarks. Thank you so, so much, Dirka. And uh, uh, Emily, any, any question from the floor? Anybody who likes to... I'm not you know. seeing anything more, and I can't see any hands raised. But um, you know, there there were um, many. Or oh, I've just seen um, a question from Samuel uh, Kariuki. Sorry if I've pronounced your name wrongly. Um, and maybe Samuel would like to take the microphone um, if that fits in with your plan, Giovanni. Please, Samuel, the floor is yours. If you like to speak up, otherwise, we'll just read the question. Shall we just read the question? Yes, Ali, please. Oh, oh, here we go. Samuel? Uh, hello, my name is uh, Samuel Kariuki. I would uh, like to ask, what are the penalties for those uh, who do abuse the DNS? Thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, and uh, just as a, a suggestion, Giovanni, and uh, maybe yeah. we could um, ask uh, Benjamin or, or um, his colleague to to answer some of the questions raised by Dirk as well at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, yeah indeed. If you, if you Benjamin and, and uh, Melina, if you like to take up any of the points uh, uh, highlighted by Dirk uh, in his intervention, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, um, also, thanks, Dirk. These are all, I think, very good questions. Um, I think I have answers to most of them. <laughs> um, so uh, you you mentioned rightly that the NIS one directive. Uh, well, it has not worked perfectly, to be honest. Um, there has been great divergence when it comes to how it was interpreted and transposed by the member states, and that's one of the main reasons, actually, why we have decided to um, propose a revision of the directive. So just to give you a few examples, you already mentioned it. There were quite wide divergences as regards the scope. So, for example when we speak of the DNS, there were certain member states that only covered authoritative DNS, while others covered only resolving uh, entities. So, and uh, when it comes to requirements, again, some member states, they had very high level requirements, basically following ISO standards, while other member states were much more detailed. And as regards to reporting, some member states, re they requested or required that you report an incident basically immediately once you find out about the incident, while others said, we can wait 72 hours until we want to hear from you. So, and our uh, directive is trying to address this. So in particular, as regards the scope, we are making it extremely clear that all entities along the DNS resolution chain are now in the scope. So that includes both authoritative DNS and resolvers. Um, we have provided some more explanations as regards the requirements, although they're still relatively high level, I admit. And finally, as regards the reporting, we've uh, set a deadline. So within 24 hours, you have to provide a first report of an incident. So, and we're hoping that these measures will help to align the national transposition a lot and to make the directive much more consistent. Um, secondly, indeed, I can confirm uh, registrars, they are not under the scope for, for, uh, for domain services, but they're under scope as authoritative uh, DNS providers if they provide such services, which I think a lot of registrars do. 
you've also mentioned uh, the generic top level domain names so um, as Polina already explained our jurisdiction our jurisdiction regime that we have proposed is that in principle or in general the general rule is that entities are supervised by the member state where they provide a service we call that concurrent um, uh, concurrent supervision um, but in the in the case of uh, providers that we consider to be highly digitized or their business models are highly digitized, we make an exception to that rule and TLDs, they fall under that exception. And that means that TLDs are only supervised by one member state. And that is the member state where you either have your main establishment or if you are located outside the EU where you have your representative. And uh, we covered them on purpose because we feel that uh, the generic top level domain names, they play an important role in the European Union. A lot of European companies register such domain names, are available under such domain names. That's why we've uh, registered and why we consider them critical. Um, before um, passing on to uh, Melina, I also would like to directly answer the last question that was um, was given orally by the audience. Uh, so um, the panel, there are penalties in the directive, but these penalties, they are addressed to the organizations that provide services. So there are penalties conceivable for, for example, DNS uh, resolvers or authoritative DNS servers. There are no penalties foreseen for DNS abuse. If you, for example, as a citizen, uh, you are a malicious actor and you're abusing the DNS for your own purposes, then um, this is not covered by the directive. The directive is also not a sector specific law for DNS, but a very general broad law covering all the sectors. And it's really about the provision of services by entities. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, Melina, uh, I don't know if you have uh, anything to add very shortly. Uh, yes, I will try to. Uh, I will try to be. <laughs> yes, sorry, I will try to be, be super short because uh, a, a lot of open questions indeed, and I think Benjamin covered most of them. Just maybe to quickly comment on two points: uh, the one on uh, potential risk of um, of less harmonized uh, transposition um, by the member states of the directive. Um, I mean. This is, I think, um, the inherent uh, difference between a directive and a regulation, that the regulation is directly applicable while a directive uh, precisely leaves room to member states on how to transpose certain uh, provisions. Um, but especially uh, in terms of um, Article 23 and uh, accuracy, this is precisely why I mentioned in the beginning that the Commission may in the future issue some guidelines in case indeed um, uh, harmonization is at stake and to, to draw from best practices and uh, hopefully uh, give some guidance on this issue if necessary. And then another point, uh, if I understood well the point, and apologize if I didn't, on um, basically arguing that potentially Article 23 may limit the scope of um, registration data and certain types just to highlight that in, a, in the original commission proposal, we did not prescribe any specific um, uh, data categories. We really wanted to leave this up to the member states. And even in the, um, in the uh, last council text as currently uh, is uh, highlighted in the general position adopted by the council, um, it, it's mentioned the word at least. So at least uh, some categories uh, are, you know, provided, but it doesn't mean this list is exhaustive or in any way limits um, member states. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Melina. And now I'd like to give uh, the floor uh, to Kid Drasek of Verisign. And uh, Verisign is uh, really you know, uh, looking uh, forward to knowing a bit more about the future of the NIST2 directive as uh, the major uh, registry player in the world. So Kit, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Giovanni, and thanks, Emily, for the invitation to participate today um, and to all the panelists. Um, I, so I, I'd like to respond. I'll, I'll be as brief as possible. I wish want to keep a few minutes for Q&A, obviously. I think some very interesting questions have been raised, um, and, and I just want to note that Verisign has been a longtime uh, supporter and strong supporter of the multi-stakeholder model and the multi-stakeholder engagement related to uh, the DNS and the um, domain name system, domain names, IP addresses. Uh, and 
some really interesting and important questions have been raised here, and that is one, the distinction between country code top level domains and generic top level domains. So I think as Dirk noted, uh, CCTLDs uh, are located typically in each member state, uh, sometimes uh, operated under the auspices of the government, sometimes under whether a university, but certainly under member state law. Um, where GTLDs are generic and more global and uh, responsible to ICANN uh, in terms of our contracts, in terms of our responsibilities, in terms of the policies established in the GTLD space. Um, and so there are some concerns, I believe, about the impact of the proposed NIST II language on the multi-stakeholder model, the multi-stakeholder engagement at ICANN. Um, another important question is the distinction between registries and registrars. Uh, and this also ties to uh, the requirements under GDPR uh, and the questions about data, who holds the data, who has the relationship with the registrant, um, and what those obligations might be and should be. I think on questions of data privacy, um, there is an ongoing and active uh, community engagement within the ICANN space to look at the question of data accuracy. There's actually a scoping effort for future policy work on the topic of data accuracy underway today at ICANN. Um, and again, this would be specific to GTLDs, not CCTLDs necessarily. Um, and so we have some questions and some concerns about the possible impact of uh, a regulatory approach in a particular jurisdiction on the multi-stakeholder engagement as it relates to GTLDs. Um, I think a key, a key question is around the roles and responsibilities of various actors and various players uh, in the internet ecosystem. Um, I, I posted a, a link to a blog that uh, I posted recently um, that focuses on some of these key questions around roles and responsibilities of various actors and definitions of DNS abuse as a, a broad heading or a, a, an umbrella term. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that different actors in the space have different roles and responsibilities and technical capabilities and different obligations under, uh, under law, including GDPR. Uh, and I'll give an example. For today, uh, and for the last more than 20 years, uh, VeriSign has not collected or held registrant data for our .com and .net TLDs. We haven't needed that information to operate the service that we provide as a registry. Um, and uh, the registrant data for .com and .net are held at the registrar level. Uh, and questions of where that data should reside, should all of that data be transferred uh, across borders, across jurisdictions, um, you know, I think is, is a question that is being dealt with within the ICANN community and the multi-stakeholder model. Um, but it's an example of a potential conflict between requirements for a registry, uh, a GTLD registry, to collect, hold, process data that we simply don't need to perform the services that we perform and have performed. Uh, and I will note with now 24 years of uninterrupted availability and uptime for .com and .net, uh, 24 years, uh, we've provided our registry services without that data Without those, without those obligations. Um, and um, we're concerned that uh, I think as, um, as Polina noted, uh, there's some extraterritorial impact uh, of this type of a regulation. What does that mean for GTLD registries that are housed outside or, or headquartered outside the, uh, the EU? And what does that mean in terms of new obligations? So I'm gonna wrap up there. Um, there's a lot to talk about here, uh, but I wanna make sure we leave su sufficient time uh, and I would refer people to the blog post link that I put into the chat uh, for additional detail, additional um, uh, information about the ongoing ICANN community efforts on DNS abuse. So thank you very much, Giovanni. Thank you so, so much, uh, um, Kit. Uh, and uh, you brought up indeed an interesting point about the need uh, of uh, holding uh, registrant data for uh, registries, GTLD registries. So thank you for having brought uh, that aspect up. 
Uh, I'd like to move uh, straight to Arda, um, who is going to, uh, you know, uh, give us the perspective of the Online Child Abuse Assessment Bureau on the uh, data accuracy, data management, and the needs to directive. So Arda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I do feel like I'm a, an odd uh, member here in this uh, technical panel, uh, but I do want to give my point of view or, or the point uh, of view of uh, the hotlines who try to identify the owner of websites. So um, even after, but also before GDPR, we have seen an enormous drop in the possibility to reach the website owners who host child abuse of material. This is uh, an ongoing problem to the, to, uh, for us. Um, what we mostly do is notify the uh, internet hosting uh, party as well as the website owner, because we know the majority of the time the website owner doesn't react. It's not mainly because of they don't want to react. Uh, we also know that the majority of these companies who do spread the material are not, as you might think, um, websites. Um, uh, with mainly this kind of material, but it's uh, for the majority image hosting websites who are very vulnerable for, uh, for this material. And we also found that these image hosting websites are not big companies, but they're most of the time small, or small uh, business enterprises, even not medium enterprises, but business enterprises who sometimes do it beside their day job um, just to get some extra money. And they do everything not to get hassle out of it. So yeah, they won't have a very uh, accurate abuse address. It's hard for us to get in touch. We have to go through all kind of lengths to 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 get to know them. And um, the thing is that what we want here is swift uh, deletion of that material because the more it, it's online, the more harm it can do. Um, I do understand because I think because they, these are small enterprises, I do understand that there are still some hurdles uh, uh, to go through and certainly for, for registrars and registries who are, some of them are also small, they're not big companies, so you need to do a lot of administrative uh, extra work, although I must say, honestly, I'm, if I'm looking from the outside, I'm going to be completely transparent because I'm a politician too, but I'm, I'm really looking for my Child Sexual Abuse uh, uh, Fight Act um, hat. Um, uh, I've heard the same discussion when GDPR came into place. People were very worried about that happening and thinking that, you know, would give uh, a lot of hassle. And of course it does, but we also seen that it does improve uh, the privacy for, uh, for uh, people online. Um, so basically, I think for us, it would be really important to have accurate data on who that website uh, owns. Uh, and for consumers, it's important as well, not only for child sexual abuse, but let me for a consumer as well to know who is behind that website. And I do understand that that might give some problems. I think uh, some very good uh, analysis around the legislation has been given, and I would advise um, to look at that. But I also think um, it is proportional uh, and it's doable. And I, I also think that you will probably have good technical uh, possibilities to solve the problem that might come uh, around administrative. Thank you. Arda, thank you so, so much uh, also for the work uh, that the Online Child Abuse Assessment Bureau is doing. And uh, it's really, you know, there are so many um, organizations doing, uh, um, you know, similar activities and they all need to be praised for what they're doing. So thank you so, so much for your work in a very, very special sector. Um, indeed, I was just reminded that we have to end the session in uh, seven minutes sharp, because that's the timing. Um, I'd like to open the floor for discussion, comments. Uh, um, everything is so complex. I don't know whose idea was this uh, of having this session in one hour. Emily and I will have to think about in the future when we think about topics, but we have already covered a lot, I think, and we have already heard a lot of uh, uh, interesting points. Um, Emily, any question from the floor? We've got um, some comments from the floor, um, appreciation about the structure and, and um, scoping of this session, you know, taking um, um, a technical uh, 
issue into the general IGF. Um, some support from Elena Plexida of ICANN for Keith's points about possible conflicting requirements in Article uh, 23. Um, um, and um, also some interest from Amir in joining the Dynamic Coalition, which I'll reply to in the chat. I can also see that um, Alan Woods has his hand up and Laurie Shulman does as well. So, Alan, please, uh, the floor is yours very shortly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giovanni and Emily. And, and thank you all. Um, just Alan Woods here. I, I work with a, a large registry called Donuts. Um, I, I suppose I just wanted to echo what Keith had said, and, and he, he made very excellent points. And, and indeed, there's a many excellent points by all the speakers. But there's two things kind of stick in my mind, and I, I just want to hammer home. I suppose one of the things is where we're very glad for the clarification as to scope. I, I would encourage people to think of the interplay of NIST too, with other, of course, uh, European uh, legislative actions as well. So if registries and registrars are both expected under Article 23 to do certain things such as collect and verify and assess, um, I would ask about concepts of you know, data minimization. And again, thinking of where the interplay between a registrar and the client and the registry and their client, the, the registrant, and, and how would that duplication amongst the various layers of the, the DNS, how does that serve you know, necessity and minimization under other things such as the GDPR? And again, these are things that will be very much hard for a registry to, to make sure that they implement correctly and in line with the law. The second point, and very briefly is just, and this is, I suppose taking a step outside of the, the DNS or me as, as, as a registry, but just generally about, you know, specific data elements um, being required under NIST too, um, and specifically looking at ones like, you know, phone numbers. And I, I just want to encourage people to think about how does that affect on a global scale? In the DNS, the, the elements that are collected under registration data that can support the, the, the ideals of NIST too is about the contactability of the registrant, ensuring they're contactable if and when there is a necessity to contact that registrant. And that doesn't necessarily mean by a, just a, a phone number. There are several elements. And if they are not maintained within the DNS or within the ICANN model itself, there are severe consequences up to you know, suspension of a domain name, deletion of a domain name. But when you say you must have something like a, exactly a, a, a phone number, that that could be a bar to entry for many people, even within Europe, within the, you know, the entire world itself, where many people might not have the luxury of a phone number. They might have an email address, which, of course, will allow them to be contactable. But again, there's these unintended consequences of ensuring something outside of the multi-stakeholder model, which is aimed at ensuring that we look at it as a global internet, not necessarily from a fractured um, internet. So these are things I would like to you know, make sure that they're still being monitored and, and thought of as we progress with NIST 2, which of course is, is welcome from a security point of view, but the unintended consequences need to be Thank you. Well. Thank you so much, Alan. I, I leave the floor to Laurie because uh, we are really now running against time. Laurie, please. Thank you. I'll just say um, something very quickly, but I do agree with Alan about the contactability point. I think that's an essential point that it's more important to contact and the means may not be as important as, as the fact that something is usable and contactable. But I do want to highlight a point coming from the perspective of the private sector and that segues from the discussions about the child uh, abuse protections. The concerns that we have with NIS2 today and the two different versions that Benjamin mentioned from the council and the parliament is this definition of legitimate access seekers. In the parliament version, it's very clear that the legitimate access seeker is, is law enforcement, period. The way I understand and read that new legislation or the, comp the, the compromise that came out of um, council. On the parliament side, it's more broad, saying typically legitimate access seekers without specific limitations. Those of us in the private sectors have deep concerns that organizations that are invested investigating harms and work very closely with law enforcement and sometimes share their information with law enforcement will not have the ability or will not be treated as legitimate if there is too much of a broad scope and not enough guidance on the definition. Thank you so, so much, uh, Laurie. That was uh, really the last intervention. I'm really sorry for that. Emily, any last minute uh, uh, point you'd like to bring up? Um, I have, I can see um, some comments. There are lots of 
um, comments in the chat. Peter Van Roster um, had chimes in at the end to say a working email address seems to uh, uh, cover most cases mentioned in this discussion. And um, there's more detailed remarks um, back on um, section 23 or article 23, which is animating people a lot, but um, uh, nothing more than that. And uh, great questions and comments uh, from the audience. Thank you very much. Indeed, Emily, thank you so much for being uh, the online moderator and the rapporteur. We will circulate the notes both on the Dynamic Coalition uh, mailing list and also on the IGF site. We have to wrap up uh, now. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, thank you to all the attendees. Uh, it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, it was clear from the beginning that we didn't have enough time to cover everything, but we did cover some very interesting points. So thank you so much. Stay tuned on the Dynamic Coalition on that and trust. We'll catch up soon. Bye-bye, everybody.